Okay, so uh, let's uh, make a start. Uh, this is your assignment, and you can do this in a very difficult way or a very simple way. Okay, I prefer the simple way, uh, which means that you use the metric tensor rather than any drawings with geometry, etc., on them. Okay, if you use that, you should be able to do this within 10 minutes easily. Okay, so it's a very simple assignment to work out the magnitude of a vector u in terms of the lattice parameters and the angle beta for the monoclinic unit cell. I could have chosen any unit cell, okay? So you, if you do it for the monoclinic unit cell, you'll be able to do it for any unit cell very, very easily. And in this case, u is a vector in real space. But supposing we did the same calculation for a vector in reciprocal space, you'd get the interplanar spacing. Okay. So I want you to understand that the metric tensor is a very useful way of doing calculations for any unit cell. I'm going to finish off today on uh, homogeneous deformations and how you can apply them to, uh, for example, in thermomechanical processing. And in the lecture to this one, I will show you the crystallography of trip and twip steels using the methods that we've learned. Okay, now this is a, a diagram you're familiar with where we represent the starting object as a sphere. And in this case, uh, we are shearing the sphere. Okay, so it's a shear deformation. You can see that that's the shear direction, and the effect of shearing is to change that sphere into this ellipsoid here. Now, this is uh, a deformation which we want to factorize into two parts. One is just compression and extension, just like the Bain strain, and then a rigid body rotation. So here, for example, is what we call the pure strain component of this deformation. So if I, if I rotate this in this direction, then you can see along these axes, I only have expansion and contraction, okay? So in general, a deformation, a homogeneous deformation will consist of a pure strain in which we just have extensions and uh, compressions, like the Bain strain, okay? Plus a rigid body rotation, R. Okay? And in order to do this factorization, you need to be able to express the deformation matrix in terms of uh, its principal axes, okay? Principal axes are those axes which remain unrotated during the course of the deformation. They may be distorted, yeah? It's different from a rotation axis. A rotation axis is not extended, but it remains pointing in the same direction. A principal axis of a deformation is unrotated, but it may be changed in length. Uh, you can see that over here. This is an unrotated axis, but its length is extended, and similarly here, it's actually contracted. Right, so we use the same principle that we did in order to find the rotation axis. That means if we take our deformation matrix, multiply it by a principal axis, then we get the principal axis multiplied by a scalar lambda, which is the extension or contraction. In the case of a rotation axis, lambda is one, okay? But here, our axis might be stretched or contracted. So this is our deformation matrix. If this is a principal axis, then it will simply be extended and will be parallel to the original vector u. So if I take this onto this side, then I can rewrite this equation as a deformation minus lambda times the identity matrix into the vector. So this is simply a rearrangement of this equation. Yeah, everyone happy with that? We did exactly the same for the rotation axis, except lambda was one. So if I expand this, then this is a set of three equations here. So the first equation is S11 minus lambda times U1 plus S12 times plus S13 times U3 is equal to zero. And similarly, I multiply this row by this column, I get a second equation, and this times this, I get a third equation. 
Now, I need to find the values of lambda for the three principal axes. Okay, so there will be three values of lambda in general, lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3. And before I tell you how to solve for those lambda values, I just want to remind you how to take the determinant of a matrix. So, supposing this is our matrix A, B, C, D, E, F and so on, then the determinant is given by A into the determinant of this bit here, which is simply E times I minus F times H and the whole thing times A, minus B into D times I minus F times G plus C into D times H minus E times G. Okay? So, that is how you solve for the determinant of a matrix. And in our case, I am taking the determinant of the deformation matrix minus lambda i, lambda i being the identity matrix. So, I want to take the determinant of this. Right, so exactly as we did in the previous example, I have this term times this minus this, uh, this times this minus this times this, okay. So, we have got that minus that. We have got minus S12 into that minus uh, S21. Yeah, yeah, that is right. So, S21, S23, wait a second, S12. Have I done this correctly? Yes. Okay, that, I, I think that is a mistake, right? Yeah, that that uh, S12, S, this should be S21, this should be S23, this should be S31 and S33 minus lambda, okay? So, I have just got that wrong. But anyway, I was trying to test you, okay? Uh, and, and similarly for the third term. So, the thing that I want you to notice here is that when I carry out this multiplication, you will get an equation which is a cubic equation because we have got a lambda here, lambda here and lambda here. So, when I multiply those out, I will get a cubic equation in lambda and when I solve that cubic equation, I will get three different values for lambda. Right, so here is an example. This is a, a deformation matrix, and uh, I, I take away lambda from these terms here, and I will get three equations. So it will be 18 minus lambda times uh, 18 minus lambda. Yeah, I will get not three equations when I take the determinant, but I will get a cubic equation. And if I solve that cubic equation, this is the cubic equation that I get by taking the determinant. Then I get three values of lambda which is 12, 30 and 18. So, these are the values by which you are extending the principal axes. Okay? So, by taking the determinant of the deformation matrix minus lambda i, you are able to solve for the three values of lambda for a real deformation. Right. We do not actually know the axes of the deformation as yet, uh, but we have solved for the values of lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3 by taking the determinant of this matrix. But we know that when we take S minus lambda i multiplied by u, we must get u. So, if I assume that my axis is u 1, u 2, u 3, I do not know what u 1, u 2 and u 3 are, I get three equations when I multiply this row by this, then this row by this and this row by this. So, there are three equations. If I then substitute a particular value of lambda into those three equations, then I only have three unknowns and I can solve for u1, u2, u3. I then repeat the procedure by substituting a second value of lambda again into those three equations 
and solve for different values of u1, u2, and u3, and then with lambda 3. So in this example, uh, I've already got my values of lambda 1, 2, and 3 by taking the determinant of this matrix. What I do now is I substitute a particular value of lambda into, what, into these equations. So let's assume that I pick 12 as the first value. Then S11 minus lambda will be 18 minus 12, which is 6. 6 times U1, so I get this term here. Okay. Minus 6 times U2, I get this term. Minus 6 times uh, minus 6 times u3, and I get this term. So that's the first equation. Then I have s21, which is minus 6 times u1. Uh, this one is 21 minus lambda. 21 minus 12 is 9 times u2, and 3 times u3 will give me a second equation. And similarly, I get a third equation for the same value of lambda. If I solve this simultaneously, which is very easy to do, because we have three unknowns, I get my first eigenvector as parallel to 2, 1, 1, okay? to the 2, 1, 1 direction. So I've solved for the first eigenvector. The second eigenvector, I do the same thing by substituting the value of lambda 2 into, the, into this set of three equations, and I find different values for u1, u2, u3, turns out to be bar 1, 1, 1, and similarly the third eigenvector is given by 0, 1, bar 1. So is that be how to find the principal axes of the real deformation? Okay. Right, and that is how uh, taking this particular uh, deformation, you can see that these are the principal axes of the deformation. Right, so we've done the most important uh, parts of both uh, coordinate transformations and deformations, and now I'm going to show you just a few examples of applications. So this is a picture that I took in a very beautiful steel plant in Brazil, it was located on the beach with palm trees and you know just absolutely wonderful fruit growing from the trees and so on. You can see how clean the whole thing is. But all that information is irrelevant. What I'm trying to show you is the thermomechanical processing of steels. So we manufacture you know, approximately 1.3 billion tons of steels every year with extremely controlled properties, very carefully controlled chemical composition. So if you are adding boron, you will control the composition to a few parts per million. And you're doing this every day. You know? So this is one of the best technologies, one of the most sophisticated technologies in the world, where back in 1960, there was a revolution in the development of steels. Uh, the properties improved dramatically. Does anybody know what that was? Of course, you were not born then, but you should know about one of the biggest technological advances ever. Any ideas? Why did the properties suddenly incre increase dramatically? It was as a result of some experiments done in Sheffield. I know that you know, okay? <laughs> What dramatically improved the properties of steel by very small additions of certain things? Connected with Brazil, okay? It's, it's not boron, but microalloying, right? Because what microalloying does is addition of a very small quantity of niobium, for example, will cause the pinning of grain boundaries during thermomechanical processing at high temperatures. So you're putting in huge amounts of deformation and the material will not easily recrystallize. And therefore, when it does recrystallize, you get extremely fine grains. And that dramatically improved the quality 
of mechanical properties that we get from steels uh, and opened up a huge business for niobium. You know, the original experiments where they used niobium, they had to buy a very small quantity of niobium at an extremely high price because there wasn't a particular use for niobium. Of course, when we make 1.3 billion tons of steel, you're going to make large use of niobium, even if you're adding only small concentrations. So, thermomechanical processing is absolutely essential, and the main principle of thermomechanical processing is to obtain fine austenite grains. Okay. And that is why we put in various kinds of deformation. So, this is the refinement of the austenite grain size by repeated recrystallization. That means the steel is going through several rolling mills, uh, several rolls. In between, there is a certain amount of time, so you've deformed it, it recrystallizes, it goes through the next roll, again, recrystallizes it into finer and finer grain size. But you might also want to leave it in a state where the austenite grains are extremely flattened, you know, like pancakes because when you flatten them, you increase the amount of surface per unit volume. And the entire reason for refining the austenite grain size is that subsequently the ferrite that forms will also be fine if the austenite grains are fine. So, refinement of ferrite grain size, you increase the nucleation rate by increasing the amount of austenite grain surface per unit volume. If you leave the grains in a pancake steaks, they have a lot of dislocations which also favor rapid nucleation of ferrite and therefore a fine grain size. And all of that can happen much more effectively if you have pinning particles, which are your niobium carbides or vanadium carbides during the thermomechanical processing. Very small concentrations. Right. So the entire story about thermomechanical processing is about getting a larger and larger surface per unit volume. So, my question is, what is the smallest grain size that you could ever achieve by thermomechanical processing? Okay. So, when you refine the grain size, the material is storing energy in the form of grain boundaries, right? And the grain boundary, let's assume, has uh, an energy of so many joules per meter squared, which will identify as sigma. And the amount of surface per unit volume which is this parameter, multiplied by sigma gives you how much energy is stored in the material in the form of a boundary. Yeah. Now, from stereology, you can relate the amount of surface per unit volume to the mean linear intercept. Now, do you know what the mean linear intercept is? So, you know, if you've got a grain structure, let's say a hexagonal grain structure, and you draw random lines on it, and you measure the segments of lines between boundaries, add them all up and take the mean, that's the mean linear intercept. Okay. That is fundamentally related to the amount of surface per unit volume by this equation, 2 over L bar. So I'll use this interchangeably. So the amount of energy that we've got to supply to the material to create a particular grain size is given by sigma times SV, which is the same as 2 sigma over the grain size measured as the mean linear intercept. Okay. Whatever you do, you've got to provide that energy. Okay, so that's a, a repetition of the previous equation. And that comes from the driving force for the transformation from austenite to ferrite. Okay. During the formation of ferrite, there's something that drives the formation of ferrite. The more grain boundaries you have, the more of that driving force is consumed in creating boundaries. So, the free energy change accompanying the formation of ferrite will be equal to the amount of energy that you store inside your material as grain boundaries and, uh, sorry, amount of material that you store as a function of uh, the ferrite grain size. And of course, the austenite grain boundaries are destroyed, so you gain that bit. And therefore, you have a basic equation that the ferrite grain size will be related to the driving force for transformation and the interfacial energy between 
the ferrite grains. And this is what that plot looks like. This is the driving force for transformation. And this is the smallest possible grain size that you get as a function of the driving force. Now, how can I control the driving force? Well, if I supercool the steel, then I have a larger driving force, right? So in other words, if I don't allow the transformation to happen until the steel reaches a low temperature, then I will get a large driving force, and the minimum grain size I could achieve is going to be smaller. According to this curve, I could easily get a nanostructured material by thermomechanical processing. But there is no steel company in the world which can produce a grain size of 0 0.01 micrometer by thermomechanical processing. If I take data from the literature, then they're all stuck at about one micrometer. Now, there is a reason for this. When you force transformation to occur at a lower temperature, the heat of transformation actually warms up the steel. Okay? So that's a process called recalescence. So when, when you force the transformation to occur at a low temperature, the transformation happens rapidly, and the heat of transformation warms up the steel. You must have seen thermal curves from steel, which show a blip when transformation happens because of the heat of transformation. So even though you forced it at a low temperature, it will warm up, and therefore you're not undercooling it as much as you would like. When you take account of that effect, which is known as uh, recalescence, whoops, recalescence, uh, that means the self-heating of the material because of the enthalpy change during transformation, you can see that we are approximately at the limit of uh, thermomechanical processing is not likely to produce a grain size finer than about one micrometer. Yeah? This is what. So it's because we want to produce very large quantities. If we only wanted to produce a tiny amount, we could make it very, very thin, and therefore the heat would dissipate very quickly, and we could achieve a much finer grain size. And this is how scientific papers are published in their hundreds, by looking at tiny quantities of material with things like equichannel angular processing and so on, but you cannot ever make that larger because of the heat of transformation. If you can find a method of taking the heat out from a large chunk of steel during processing, then you would become very rich. So this is the second method I've given you for being rich. Okay? A pre in a previous lecture, I gave you another example. I cannot imagine how to do that in a large piece of steel. So we are stuck basically at that sort of a grain size, but a one micrometer grain size is not bad. You know, that's a real achievement to get a one micrometer grain size. And there are extremely sophisticated processes that we use to produce uh, equiaxed austenite with a very fine grain size or pancaked austenite where we flatten the austenite and there's an additional driving force, which is the deformation in the material. So it's very, very important to know how much surface you create during thermomechanical processing. And it isn't just the surface, but also the edges of the grains, which are more potent nucleation sites than the faces of the grains, and the corners of the grains, which are even more effective at nucleating ferrite. So how do we do this? Okay, this is just showing you uh, equiax grains and pancaked grains of austenite. Right, so the majority of the literature treats the austenite grain as a sphere, which then, by rolling deformation, changes into a flattened sphere, like an M&M. &M. Okay? Now, what's wrong with treating a grain as a sphere? Yeah? And, uh, and uh, what else? I mean, do you ever see spherical grains? Why? Why not? You know, whatever object you use to represent a grain, it's got to be space-filling again. Otherwise, you have holes, right? Uh, okay, so um, 
people then started using cubes, which by rolling deformation get flattened out. And that's still not right, is it? I can fill space now, but what, we, what would be wrong with that? You know, when you look at a cross-section of a grain structure, here, for example, there has to be a balancing of interfacial tensions there, right? You cannot have angles between faces which are 90 degrees unless there are some spe very special cases of different interfacial energies and so on. So, it's got to be space filling and the angles that the boundary make with, with uh, other grains have to be consistent with the balancing of interfacial tensions. And the object that most closely satisfies those criteria. Of course, the reason for using simple shapes is that the mathematics becomes simple. Okay? The object that meets those criteria best is called a tetrachidodecahedron. Right? This, this was invented by Kelvin, you know, absolute temperature Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, which consists of a series of hexagonal and square faces and the junctions have approximately the right angle for satisfying interfacial tensions. And furthermore, when you stack these tetrachide decahedra on top of each other, they will fill space. Now, we can define this shape by a series of just six vectors, right? So, A is the length over here, and all of the vectors which define the edges are just six vectors. Problem solved, yeah? All we have to do is define a deformation matrix for whatever process we are using, operate on these vectors, we get a new set of six vectors, we can work out the areas between the vectors, in other words the amount of surface in the deformed object, we can work out how the edge length has changed and so on. Very, very simple. Deformation matrix multiplied by all these vectors, you've got a new shape, new surface area, new edge length. Yeah, so all we do is we've got our six vectors, we calculate the new six vectors, therefore we have the shape of a new object, its surface area and the edge length. So I just want to show you some examples of the deformation matrix for rolling, for wire drawing, for forging and so on. So in that deformation matrix, uh, if we think about rolling as plane strain compression, plane strain compression means, you know, when you're rolling, there's no extension along the length. Yeah? The material simply elongates and thins, right? Because of friction, there's no extension along the length of the rail. So S22 here is 1. In other words, if this is my roll, I will not get any extension along this length. Okay, S, S22 is 1. Uh, along the compression direction, S11 will be less than 1 and the opposite for the elongation direction. So we've got a very simple deformation matrix for rolling where we have just less than one, one and greater than one. Okay? This is one upon S11 because we've got to conserve volume. Right? Um, if we look at axisymmetric compression which is like forging. Yeah? So you take a cylinder and you forge it. That's axisymmetric compression. You can easily derive the values of S, S11, S22 and S33 and the rest of them being zero. Similarly, if you're doing wire drawing, that's axisymmetric tension and we've got the terms here. And if you have a shear, then again, we've got a deformation matrix. So whatever deformation you think of, you can easily derive a deformation matrix for most of the processes that we are dealing with. And here are some calculations. So this was our original tetrachide decahedron. Uh, 
as a consequence of rolling de deformation, which we are approximating as plane strain compression, the object becomes like this. It's still space filling. We can work out the areas of all these faces, and you can see exactly how the amount of surface per unit volume changes compared with the original value of the undeformed material as we increase the amount of deformation. Okay? And this is the amount of edge length that increases as you deform the material. So corners are much more higher energy states than edges, which are higher than a face of a grain. So nucleation first happens at corners. When those sites are exhausted, they might continue along edges and then along faces or they might happen simultaneously. So this can now go into models for microstructure development during cooling. You can uh, expand those equations, uh, the matrix equations, and write them explicitly. So here is that ratio as a function of the different values of principle uh, of um, distortions within your deformation matrix, the values of S11, etc. This is how the surface area changes as a function of the deformation and how the edge length changes as a function of deformation. This is for forging and you get a different function uh, and in some cases we want to roll along two directions. So we first roll the steel, then we change it through 90 degrees and roll again in order to get isotropic properties. Okay? So cross rolling. So first you roll in this direction and then you roll uh, in this direction in order to make either a wider plate or to get uh, more isotropic properties. That's very easy to deal with. First you apply the deformation matrix for plane strain compression, then you apply a rotation matrix to 90 degrees, and then again the same plane strain compression matrix. So here we are. This is the first rolling pass, rotation by 90 degrees. Okay, you can see this is like a symmetry operation. Okay, rotation by 90 degrees across the normal to the steel plate, and this is again a second rolling pass but now the plate is oriented through 90 degrees and that gives you the deformation matrix for a cross-rolled product. Yeah. And that will have a different behavior for the amount of surface per unit volume. Okay, that's just the same but for the edges. Now, in real life, Rolling isn't actually a homogeneous deformation. Okay. Near the roll faces, you have more friction, and therefore you have a greater amount of shear at the surface than in the core of the material. So there will be a gradient of shear through the thickness. And if you know that gradient, then there's no problem in working out the amount of surface that you create as a function of the depth within the material. And you can commercially buy a steel where deliberately you put more shear on the surface than the core so that you get very, very nice properties on the surface compared with the core which is not exposed to the external influences. Okay? So you get very fine grain structures on the surface and you don't need to deform the whole steel with large strains. Uh, the core of the material doesn't experience the same conditions as a surface, for example, in fatigue properties and so on. So there's no problem in treating a complex deformation if you know how the deformation varies as a function of distance because you just put several regions into your computer to calculate curves at different locations. Okay, this, this is just to show you how the shear strain actually varies in one particular case from the surface to the center of the steel. And therefore, you get a corresponding variation in the amount of, in the grain size that you create inside your material. 
Now, there are many structures in which the starting grain is not isotropic. Yeah? So, for example, if you are going to roll a martensitic steel, then martensite plates are not tetrachidecahedra, they are plate shaped. Okay? And then the orientation of the plate relative to your deformation also matters. And that's very easy to handle. So, let's imagine that we have a plate oriented in this direction and others are oriented here and then at random and so forth. You can apply your deformation matrix taking account of the anisotropy of the shape that you're modeling because you, you will have a different set of vectors for every plate of martensite. And you can see huge variation now in the amount of deformation that each plate experiences depending on the orientation. Okay. And similarly, the amount of edge that you create. Now, these examples are actually used in practice in computer programs for working out the microstructure of steels. I want to introduce you to a little bit more. Um, this is the tetrachidecahedra that we talked about were all uniform in size. That's a limitation, right? Because real grains are not all exactly identical in size. And therefore, you might get a discrepancy between the calculated and measured results. So, in GIFT, we created a model in which you don't have regular tetrahedra of exactly the same size, but they differ in size, still fill space, okay? Now, it turns out that when we use the usual distributions of grains that we have in steels, it doesn't make any significant difference to assuming a uniform tetrachidecahedron, okay? So, this is a, a, a uniform tetrachidecahedron is a very good approximation to calculate the amount of surface and edge length per unit volume. Now, in, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk to you about um, the crystallography of trip steels and of twip. And in order to deal with that, we, we will have hundreds and hundreds of austenite grains undergoing martensitic transformations. The orientations of the austenite grains are different. How do we cope with that? So I'm just briefly going to introduce you uh, to the concept that we will use. So this is a specimen of austenite which was polished flat, completely flat. And it had scratches on it, straight scratches. When martensite forms, those scratches are deflected. Okay? That's the deformation caused by the martensite itself. And in trip steels, we need to take account of that deformation. In twip steels, it's twinning. And twinning actually has a larger deformation than martensitic transformation. So, in martensite, the shear strain is about 0 0.26. In twinning, it's 1 over square root of 2, which is 0 0.7071, roughly. Yeah? So, twinning is actually a much larger deformation than martensitic transformation. So, what would happen to a vector which crosses the, sorry, that's just another uh, example showing you the deflection of scratches because of the shear deformation. Well, we, we've got our deformation matrix here, uh, defined in the coordinate system where Z1 is here and Z3 is here, simple. And in the last lecture, we did a similarity transformation to express it in terms of any coordinate system x. Okay. And we ended up with this equation where d1, d2, d3 are the components of a unit vector along the displacement direction. And p1, p2, p3 is a unit normal to the habit plane on which the shear happens, okay, the, the invariant plane here. And I explained to you that this equation can be represented very simply as something like this. This is a 3 by 3 matrix. This is an identity matrix, the displacement, uh, magnitude of the displacement, unit vector in the displacement direction, and unit normal to the habit plane.
So if I have an austenite grain, and before transformation I have a vector u, after transformation it will become a new vector v, which is the sum of these segments of u which are not affected, plus this deflection here. Okay? So this deflection here is delta u. So this bit here is given by the deformation matrix times delta u, okay? Uh, sorry, delta u. And this bit is simply this and this. So knowing the deformation caused by martensite, we can work out how any vector is changed by the transformation, okay? So, you know, the question that we want to answer in a future lecture is how does the deformation caused by martensite or by twinning add to the ductility of the steel? Yeah? Because it's a physical deformation. It may be a change in crystal structure, but you saw in the previous slide that the surface has changed dramatically. It used to be mirror finish, and by formation of martensite, you deflect the surface and you get deflections of scratches. So it's a deformation like any deformation, it just happens to change the crystal structure. So by using our methods, we can work out exactly how any vector is going to change. And therefore, we should be able to work out the elongation caused by transformation or by twinning. Okay? So I won't give away the story now. Uh, it's a very interesting story on how the martensite reaction contributes to ductility in steels and similarly the twip steels. Okay? So I'm going to stop now and see you in one week's time. <laughs>